My name is Ian Strachan and I'm here in Leconte Bay. My teammate Eric and I are here to document the southernmost tidewater glacier in the northern hemisphere. The goal of Some Dumb Project is to show never before seen perspectives of something that won't be seen for very much longer. Despite our years of experience documenting glaciers, we'd never seen a bird's eye view of a calving event. While this was our initial inspiration, the project developed into a much more personal story. From collaborations with a local high school to the very ice itself, We hope you will enjoy this brief look at one small corner of the world in a changing environment. We start our project in Petersburg, a small town in southeast Alaska, which was founded due to its proximity to Lacan Glacier. The glacial ice was an essential resource used by the fishing fleet to keep its catch fresh. Good morning, gentlemen. It's going to be a good day. Good. Fair skies. Calm seas. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, we're good with fuel. All right. The fire remains. Plants enough. Glacier is located in a protected wilderness area, preserving its natural grandeur and prohibiting motorized equipment of any kind. This meant that all our aerial operations took place from and over the water. Glacier is a river of ice, constantly flowing downhill. The sheer size of this river of ice is hard to fathom. The face spans roughly a mile across and rises to 200 feet tall from the water level. As all that pressure from miles of ice builds up behind the face, eventually it becomes unstable and breaks off. This event is called calving. That whole face goes, it's gonna send. Oh, that would be. Oh, there it goes! There it goes. Dude. There it goes. It's important to note that these glaciers aren't calving all the time. Even one as active as Lacan will sometimes be quiet for hours and hours.
But it's not a matter of if this ice will fall, it's just a matter of when. That's true. Let's just start it. Let's just see what happens. Might as well. As you can imagine, while we are trying to capture these events, it takes a lot of waiting. And waiting. And waiting. Oh, pressure. Ah, ah, ah. That popped up. Oh, yes, it did. It all comes down to time, luck, and batteries. Lots of batteries. As you can see, it's a little rainy and windy out there. Uh, so we're here. This is the conch. Uh, Looks like it's going to be a little bit wet. A little bit wet. A little bit wet. That's all right. It's Alaska. To get a more intimate look at this recently scoured landscape, as well as setting up to collect cleaner audio, we have to get our boots on the ground. All right, gentlemen. Hi. Thanks so much. Fun. I hope to see you again. Yeah. Sometime, <laughs> somewhere. Welcome to the wilderness. We certainly aren't the only people, or the first, to be fascinated by this glacier. In fact, there's been a student survey project that has been ongoing out of Petersburg High School since 1983. So this is a theodolite, and we look through the optics, and we line it up with the object we're measuring and determine the degrees of what we're measuring. 50, 37, 6, no gap. I haven't put any sunscreen on yet. Oh, that's good. Yeah. 0.6. Yeah. 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 When we turn and pick points out on the glacier, on the uh, edge of the glacier, we can measure the angle from the other group to that point. And they're measuring the angles f from their side, so then we can find exactly where they match up. These students have given up their lunch period every Wednesday for three years to be part of what is one of the longest running citizen science projects in the United States. This extracurricular program was pioneered by the now retired Paul Bowen, who still lives in Petersburg. Jonesy field trips, well, there's some of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name is Paul Bowen, I'm a retired teacher here in Petersburg, Alaska, Petersburg High School. I started teaching in 62, and the uh, superintendent asked me, uh, after I was here a couple of years and science classes are going well, if I'd teach a couple electives. I see your backgrounds in geology and, and uh, surveying, so uh, I said, sure, I'll give it a try. So this is 1983. So this is the. Oh. So this is the. This is that. This first. is it. Yeah. Wow. I haven't looked at this in years. Yeah. The thing that came up with uh, the glacier uh, idea was uh, 
that I asked him one day in class, in, in geology class actually, because I didn't have the surveying yet, how many students have been over to Lacant Glacier? And a couple raised their hands up, 18, 20 kids in the class, and I was surprised. Well, it was, it was a fish, it's a fishing town, really a village in that time, and it really still is by standards. I decided that, that since the students uh, really had not been out of this wonderful environment very far, they have boats, uh, I thought, my gosh, uh, I think uh, as part of a science education, it would be wonderful to have some practical experiences in, in their own environment. The cost of the uh, operation was relatively inexpensive at the time uh, I, uh, because I, I wrote grants. And the grant money was just for the helicopter ride. We had the surveying equipment. Helicopter uh, cost at that time uh, uh, was $848. And the, the helicopter agency that was here kept that price ever since. And it was in a very restricted wilderness area at the time classification. But thanks to the Forest Service help with some of the other people, we got an exemption. And so then the university uh, piggybacked us and, and got them in here too. And then that grew from there. This book is from 1996, back before they had the iPads, they would draw the sketches. Actually, yeah, this is really cool to me because um, it's like part of our town, like our high school has like the research grant here, so it's kind of special that we get to come out here and do this because we're some of the only kids that will ever get to come out here and do this. This is my first time up here, but I've been uh, practicing with the surveyors for two years. So we usually just practice setting up the theodolite. And uh, we also, every year, the, the group that comes up, when they come back, we do the math night to figure out uh, how far the glacier has actually receded. Look at that. Wow. Isn't that so crazy? it has gone back. It's um, The north side's receding faster than the south side. Yeah. So how many, how far back do you think? How many blocks? Uh, it from we just did a rough estimate. Rough it estimate. looked about 300 feet. 300 feet. Wow, yeah. that's surprising. From last I didn't year, think it was that far. Yeah. Over the past three decades, the students have been able to precisely show the glacier's steady retreat of several miles. It's spread to the, most of the town now mm -hmm. as to the knowledge of what the glacier doing this year, asking the students later on. And a number of, have, have gone into the fields of geology and the surveying also. You can see it like clearly. Oh, the that's snow. so was, cool. This is so cool. And the sun was shining. Yeah, I, anybody want a piece of jerky? I will take yes. a piece of <laughs> Once you get them enthused in that, they, their energy is just like they are as a sport. They're just, they excel and they want to go. And we got to find out more about this, Mr. Gordon. I think we can. We, we just are a part of this and then suddenly they are. Yeah, it's the same thing. So the, uh, the students also found the slides. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> These students, they are some of the cream of the crop of our class, and I think I've got all the valedictorians here in these groups. Because we've been working all year up to this one experience, we always get lucky with this weather. It was beautiful last year, and it's just beautiful again today. You know, 70 degrees is not something we're used to. The last two days have been beautiful. You know, tomorrow the weather's supposed to go back to normal, which is heavy rain. So what are we doing, Eric? Getting wet. For real wet. Are we also waiting for the tide? Oh yeah, we're also... <laughs> I'm just getting wet, I don't know about you. not the worst place to wait in the world, but it, it could be less rainy. What we can see of the frozen wall is breathtaking, but the glacier face also continues hundreds of feet down under the surface. Eroded by the tidal waters, huge tongues of ice will break off from below and shoot to the surface where they become icebergs. One of the most fascinating aspects of the glacial environment is the sound. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, now I know what else to do, right? Sound isn't something that many people are actively aware of, especially in such a visually spectacular place. But think about how critical it is to the experience and to calving events. So this is a hydrophone, it's an underwater microphone, and what we're looking to do is take some recordings of what it sounds like down here. So let's take a listen. It's loud. It's actually a lot more noisy than you would expect. There's this ubiquitous snap, crackle, pop sound. We call it ice crispies. All these little clicks that you hear are caused by air bubbles escaping from the melting ice that surrounds us. This air is ancient. It was trapped in the ice long ago at the upper elevations, where the snow accumulates to form a basin from which these glaciers flow. Eventually, the ice calves off the face of the glacier and begins melting, releasing the air bubbles after their downhill journey that has lasted for several centuries.
vertical though. Yeah. That's it's different. A... That is different to see from that vertical. Are you getting some of these uh, uh, shooters coming up? Those, yeah. Uh, the blue shooters? You can see the... Jesus. You know, the name of that glacier, it should have been, in my opinion, Hootley. That's that clinket word for uh, the, the flapping of the Thunderbirds. The yeah. That's there's booming, crashing. Our time spent watching the spectacle of these colossal pieces of ice crashing downwards has carved the glacier into our memories forever. And hopefully, sharing its grandeur has made an impression on you as well. But as Leconte diminishes, along with most of the tidewater glaciers in southeast Alaska, it will recede to a point where the face no longer reaches the water, and these impactful calvings will no longer occur. There will be no thunderous booms as the ice hits the surface or bergs of blue floating in the fjord. And while the landscape it leaves behind is impressive in its own right, it will be but an echo of what it once was. We hope that sharing the story of this glacier and its connection to the local community will inspire you to be more interested in global systems and the changing environments in your own backyard. Yeah, move. <laughs> 